Welcome everyone to day number two of the five day um, virtual summit. And today, uh, let's see, it's only six o'clock. So we are gonna give it, you know, like two more minutes for people to join us. And we have someone here already. Awesome. Hi, Sandra. Thanks for joining us. If you are here, drop an emoji in the comments so we can say hello. Um, we're going to start in two minutes. And this one is going to be a great one. So get your pen and paper ready so you can take some notes um, from all the nuggets that are going to be dropped today. So in two minutes, I'm going to introduce you to our guest speaker for today. So in the meantime, guys, let's roll the comment from Sandra. In the meantime, just so you all know, this five um, free virtual um, summon is brought to you and is sponsored by the Ghost Layer um, Show. And I am going to be your host for the five days. And today's day number two. And I am Rosa Barrigan, your online business coach for virtual assistant. I have virtual assistants create, launch, and grow their business from scratch. If you want to know more about me, you can check my website out. It's rosaberryget.com. So as you are coming in, make sure you drop something in the comments so my next guest and myself can say hello and that we know that you're here, right? So let's see, 601. So, okay, so we're going to get started because we want to be mindful of people's time. If you register, just a little housekeeping, if you register for the summit, you already got an email from me saying, welcome to my tribe with the password to my toolkit full of resources for personal and business use. And you're going to be entered into a drawing and you can register for the summit anytime during the five days. Um, so you can be entered into um, our final day raffle. If you have questions, inbox me after the live and I can help you. So let's get started, guys. So let me introduce you to our next guest. Um, let me go my little notes here. So, okay, so I want to welcome my next guest. She is an amazing mompreneur, a wife, and a goal slayer. She currently works as a finance manager for a nonprofit organization. She's also the CEO of an event planning business called Memorable Events by Paula D. Today, she will be sharing some tips, some strategies, on how you can actually manage your finances and start to repay your credit score. So without further ado, would you guys help me welcome? Hi. Hi, Paula. Hi, Rosa. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. Let me see if anybody else is here joining us. So Paula, did I make an introduction? Yes. <laughs> Everything sounds good. Oh, everything sounds good. I don't know. Cool. So Paula's going to talk to us about how we can repair our credit, how we can take control of our finances, especially around this time with all the COVID going on and people getting laid off and all those crazy things that are happening. So Paula, the floor is yours. I'll be here, but you can be the one on screen, okay? Sure. Sounds good. Thank you, Rosa. So as Rosa said, my name is Paula. Um, so... Of course, Rose, this is my first time doing it, so please be here with me. Um, needless to say, you can probably tell. Um, a few things that I wanted to touch on today is um, how to manage your credit. Um, there are four different things that I want to underscore um, in this goal, slay goal slayer show that I'm doing with you guys today. Um, one of the things that we find a little bit difficult to deal with, especially now, is um, how to manage our finances. Um, the first thing that I wanted to talk about is managing your credit. A lot of you guys know nowadays, um, not even nowadays, to deal with anything in this world, you need to have credit. Um, cash is great, but at the end of the day, you do need credit in order for you to buy a home, buy a car, um, Anything that you're doing in life right now, you really do need to have your credit in check in order for you to be successful in what you're looking for. Um, a few things that I wanted to touch base on in managing your credit is knowing your score. So I don't know how often people um, 
look at their scores or um, now they give you free credit scores. You, with most credit cards, if people, whether you have good, bad credit or whatever type of credit that you have, most credit cards do offer some type of um, credit score. They keep you in check to help you to figure out how to stimulate your credit, how to boost your credit. Um, one thing I would advise is on a monthly basis, definitely check your credit score. You want to make sure that you are um, managing how you shop, how you spend, um, and how you deal with your overall credit. Um, I kind of put the managing your credit first, but I should have actually put that really last because um, some of the things that you need to do in order for you to manage your credit is preparing your budget. Um, the first thing that I do, I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to use myself as an example for the way that I manage my credit and the way that I um, plan my finances. So every month I actually write down, I have a book where I actually down, write down all of my credit, um, all the credit cards that I have, all of my monthly expenses, how much I make each month. Um, like Rosa said, I am a small business owner. I was working, um, I was doing my business full time, but now that I'm working, um, what I do is I actually figure out what I'm bringing in each month, what I'm bringing in each um, week and how to basically disperse all my, um, my income in order for me to have a reserve, save some money for rainy day, um, make sure that, you know, if I need to do something that I'm not overcharging my credit. Um, first thing I will tell everybody is get yourself a notebook, get yourself um, some type of planner. It doesn't have to be something expensive. It could be something very inexpensive, but you need to jot that down. The best way to do it is to start with highest, lowest to highest. So what I tell people is what I do is I write down all of my regular reoccurring charges, which is um, household expense, phone bills, utilities, um, gas. I mean, gas is here, you know, sometimes it fluctuates, but that's something that you definitely need to put in because especially if you're commuting to work, you definitely need to put into account the um, your gas. Um, insurance, those are all things that you need to put with household. Then you need to start counting in your credit. Um, what you have for cards. I don't normally include my student loan. I put that all the way at the end. I know a lot of people probably going to kill me at the end, but We'll talk about the student loans later. Um, more importantly, I would say start with the lowest to highest. So what I normally do is I would write down all of my cards that I have, um, whether it's paid, it's not paid, you just jot down all your cards. So for example, if you have, let's say five credit cards, you would write American Express, Discover, MasterCard, Visa. Let's say you have two visas, Visa. Um, you put those down and you start writing how much you owe for each one. If you don't owe anything, it's great. Still keep it on the top, but how much you owe for each one. And what my suggestion is in order for you to manage your credit and bring your credit score is start paying some stuff off, but pay them off. Minimum payments are definitely a must. If you can't do anything else each month, make sure you pay your minimum payment. That definitely helps with um, managing your score and making sure that you have a good credit score. The thing that hurts you most with credit is how much of your credit you use. But what I will tell people, especially with times like this, it's difficult to you know, save like you would wanna save. Make sure if you can't do anything else, pay your minimum payment each month. That definitely looks good on your credit. It doesn't, um, it hurts more when you use most of your credit, but it definitely makes an impression on creditors when they know that you're trustworthy. Um, so with that being said, back to how to score them, you wanna make sure that you have the lowest to highest and each month you pay something. Now, once you're done paying yourself, let's say if you make, $1,000 a week. You take that $1,000 right off the bat, pay yourself. You remove $100 off of that minimum 10% and put it to the side. That shouldn't even be counted into your part of your income. 
and that's not gross, that's your net. So if you're taking home net $1,000, you need to put at least $100 aside for you to save. Don't look at that. And I know people will say, oh my God, it's hard to do that. And it's difficult to live paycheck to paycheck. But I find that when you're not working, you're able to figure it out and manage. But when people are working, it's you know living from paycheck to take paycheck to paycheck. Don't think about it. Put that $100 aside, put that 10% aside and don't look at it. That's your rainy day. That's the start of your rainy day fund. Then what you also need to start doing is you need to figure out, well, I pay my tithes and offerings. So if anybody else is doing that as well, that's another 10% that you need to take aside. So that's $200. So now you're only really left with $800. Now you need to calculate. Okay, so overall I have five credit cards and all these five credit cards, how much do they all total? Then When you get that total, you need to also calculate how much is your monthly minimum due for each credit card. What my suggestion would be is when you start with the top to bottom, if you make an additional payment, if you can make an additional payment to that smallest limit that you have or the smallest outstanding balance, that will help that balance to go down a little bit quicker. So if you're making monthly payments, and let's say if you have an extra $100 that you can throw in there towards your bill, I don't suggest that you take that extra $100 and you say, I'm going to give $10 to this one, $10 to this, $10 to this. No, if you can do minimum payment on all your credit cards and pay an additional $100, pay it on the smallest balance. Because then what will happen is once you start taking care of that, it will be reported that that limit is now available on your credit. The goal is for your score to go up is to use no more than 30% of your um, available credit. Once you go over that 30%, it does affect um, how much of your credit score will get hit, if that makes sense. Um, If somebody has a question about that, they can ask me afterwards. I'm explaining it in a way that I understand it, but I know it might not make sense to people. But um, when you use more than 30% of your um, available credit or your um, credit, it definitely takes a hit on your card. So my advice to you is the best way to manage it, get rid of the small one. Now that you're done with the small one, you have that extra $100 that you apply and the balance is done. Now you'll have one card that's eliminated and you're left with four cards. I do, for me, I find the snowball effect is the best way to, that's that's the term that's used for that um, snowball effect is the best way to kind of bring your credit score up a little bit because now you'll have more of your not available credit for one particular card, but overall, so it does make a difference in your credit. Um, Another thing that I have on my talking points, my outline here is managing your finance. You... There are a lot of things that people are um, signed up for, especially like right now where we can't utilize, like the gym, gym memberships. Get rid of them. I mean, now that you can't go anywhere, exercise, walk around the block. Instead of applying that $50 to the gym or for that extra benefit of the sauna, whatever it is, take that $50, apply it to your credit because at the end of the day, yeah, you will look good, but you will have messed up credit and it won't be as great. It won't, it'll, you'll look good, but you won't feel as good. So walk around the block, exercise at your house, figure out something else, go for a walk with friends. I mean, summertime is coming. There's other things that you can do. Take that gym membership that you're, if you're not using it, I mean, if you're a gym junkie and you love to go to the gym, I don't want to take that away from you. But, um, I always tell people, I'm like, if you're not using something, don't consider it as donation because you're not putting it on your taxes at the end of the year, get rid of it and start applying that money that they're taking out automatically towards your debt. Um, Another thing that people get is subscriptions, Netflix, um, Showtime, magazines, get rid of things that you don't need. Um, It actually brings me into the next um, PowerPoint that I have on here is eliminating your debts. What are your needs and what are your wants? What are things that you definitely need and what are things that you just want um at the end of the day your credit if you're looking to move further in life you can't really do that without your credit i mean yeah you could travel you could do this but you're living on living on credit is really um doesn't look good 
and I'm not saying credit is, it's necessary, but you shouldn't be able to just live on your credit. Your credit should be there as if you have an emergency, if you have, um, if so, like your car breaks down and you don't want to, you know, you, you need credit. Don't get me wrong, but you shouldn't be just living off of credit. Um, so understand your needs and your wants. What are things that you need when you go to the store and you're, you know, shopping? Do you need the $500 handbag or can you afford to go to TJ Maxx and get it for $100, which is ridiculous, but to each his own, not to judge anybody or anything, but definitely would advise people to um, calculate your needs and your wants. Um, I know I'm really all over the place with this. I, I think I do better with um, a conversation since I'm doing this <laughs> without Rosa. It hurts a little, <laughs> but um, you're doing, you are doing amazing. Yeah, I'm struggling here with this, but I mean, I understand what I'm saying, but I guess I'm I'm better at answering questions and guiding people versus just explaining it. I'm more of a, <laughs> I'm more of a, I can show you instead of just telling, well, I can tell you too, but it's difficult. So yeah. So we got one question. Uh -huh. So someone trying to purchase at home. Yeah. Should they go out and buy a new car? Absolutely not. If you're looking to buy a new home, I mean, if you have a car already and your car works, what is the point of buying a new car if you have such a big, big expense that's going to that's gonna really impact your credit? You're going to get this car, which every time you have an inquiry, that does affect your credit. It stays on there for, I believe, two years. Don't quote me on that. It's been a while since I've looked at that. But um, it definitely impacts your credit, making having new inquiries. So if you don't need a new car, I don't suggest going out to buy a new car if you could afford to get by with what you have. I mean, I like to say to people, like, I'm comfortable. If, if you see what I drive, you'll say, oh, my God, you know, I can get another car. But I'm not going to get another car if the one that I have works. Does it make sense for me to go? I'm not impressing anyone. I would rather be able to sleep at night knowing that my car works in the morning instead of not being able to sleep because the debt has to be paid and COVID-19 is affecting my finances. Mm -hmm. that yeah, that makes sense. So, so another question, what would be considered financial freedom? Financial freedom is being able to say I'm going on vacation and I am not using a credit card to go on vacation and I'm using a debit card. That's financial freedom. Um, a lot of people are not, I'll use myself as an example. I wasn't raised to learn how to budget and um, how to fix my credit and all those things. I had to learn on my own. As a matter of fact, through trial and error, I learned how to fix my credit. And then I, you know, with education, that's another thing I would advise you. So the company that I work for now, um, not looking to promote anything, um, the company that I work for now, the reason why I actually um, was sold on it is because they offer financial education. They actually point you in the right path for you to learn how to actually not just fix your credit, they help you to fix your credit, but they help you for you to learn how to be in control of your finances so that you're not overwhelmed. Because not being financially free is it'll mess up your relationship. It'll cause you to not be able to sleep. It drives, I mean, it, there's a lot behind stress and finance. So not having financial freedom definitely does affect one, one's overall life. Mm -hmm. What about other, other areas of our lives, not having financial freedom? Say that again? I said not having financial freedom can really affect other areas of our life. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I mean, nothing else just to be able to sleep at night knowing that you don't owe any creditors you know? so now, up. guys as we're talking if you have other questions just um type them in the comments and i can see them and i can tell paula about it so paula another question is it true that you should pay um our credit cards so if we purchase something with a credit card do we pay the credit card bill before the bill arrives in order to boost our credit score? So paying the card before the before the bill comes out, what it does is it eliminates the interest that you'd have to pay. So is this reported to the credit bureau if we pay it. 
it does get reported to the credit bureau. Um, the ink, it will show that you did make um, a purchase on the card and that you paid it off. So it definitely looks good to use the card. Um, having the card is one thing. You sh you should not to say that you have to use it. You should be able to use it, but it is also showing that you're responsible. Creditors want to know that you're not just borrowing the money and you're leaving it there just to, you know, just to say you have the credit card. You need to be able to show like, oh, I'm responsible. I borrowed this money and I returned it. I returned it on time and I returned it, you know, when it's due and the amount that's due and you're not just putting it off. So financial, you're, you're being responsible, basically. So um, that definitely makes a difference. But just keep in mind, um, again, with that 30%, so if you have a thousand dollar limit, try not using more than three hundred dollars of it. Um, a lot of cards, you're what people don't understand is, I'm pretty sure a lot of people could say I maxed out my credit card, and you really don't know what you really bought. When you think about it, you're like, what did I buy for all this money? What did I spend five thousand dollars on? I can't even remember what it was for. Guilty. <laughs> so. You know, just keep that in the back of your mind before you start charging. But 30% is really what you, you don't want to go over that 30%. And you'll see how quick your credit score. And another way for me to explain it is credit is really like a diet. It's quick for you to pile it on, but it's hard for it to come off. So keep that in mind. You don't want it. It sure is. So I have one more question. So another question is, what happens if you are, let's say, a 19-year-old, 20-year-old, um, a freshman in college maybe, and then you don't, you know, you're not educated about your finances and you start using credit cards. Now you're like a full-blown adult trying to purchase at home maybe, and you're trying to repay your credit score. How do you um, settle those debts? Or is it okay to settle versus paying the full amount? So that's a good question, actually. That was my biggest mistake. When I turned 18, I think I had every credit card that exists. And I'm going to be very honest with you. When you're getting those things, that's one of the things that colleges don't teach you, school doesn't teach you. They don't teach you how to get those credit cards and what to do with them. If your parents don't set you on the right path, you're pretty much on your own to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, the company that I actually work for was actually one of the companies that I went to years ago sad to say years ago like that, but years ago, and somehow it's in full circle. When I try to learn how to fix my credit, they're the ones who actually gave me the right path to get back on track. So um, what I would suggest is get some credit counseling. Um, there are companies that will help you to manage it, like credit counseling, um, American, Consumer, uh, American Consumer Credit Counseling. There are... Um, Another thing that you can do, you can have a buddy system. If you have somebody that you trust that you can say like, hey, look at my journal of what I, and I track everything. So when I use and I spend, I track it. Look at what I'm doing. This is my journal. I'm going to look what you're doing. And then you guys kind of hold each other accountable. Mm -hmm. That way you start to see things that, okay, did you really need to buy that? What did you spend that much money on? When you're aware, it actually opens up your eyes and make you say, oh, wow. It does. That? So if you do have somebody that you trust, I mean, that's just another suggestion. If you do have someone that you trust, I definitely um, suggest if you have somebody holding you accountable, like your husband, your boyfriend, your whatever, significant other. Hey, um, these are the bills. These are what I'm paying. This is the income. This is what we have coming in. Um, we seem to have more debt than we do money. So how do we get started to knock some of this debt down. So accountability is definitely important. It is important. It helps a lot. When you're falling off the wagon, like some of us do. <laughs> yeah, accountability. <laughs> so another question, when is a good time to file for bankruptcy? Because lately, a lot of people are, before the COVID-19 issue, a lot of people are like maxing out their credit cards because they know that they can file for bankruptcy. Okay, so bankruptcy has changed so much um, throughout the years. I used to actually be a collection creditor, a collection specialist back in the days. And 
Back then, you could file bankruptcy and your debt's dissolved. You don't have to worry about it. It's done now. What they actually do is they teach you how to fix that. They make you pay a certain amount of it back. Not all of your, first of all, student loans never go away. So if you got them, forget about forget about bankruptcy. Um, that's one debt I would also advise people, please do not, if you cannot afford to pay your student loans, call those people. They will work with you. Do not not pay those student loans because they will come and they will get you. Your taxes, your accounts, they will get you. So you pay them or you call them. Communication is important. Um, but back to what I'm sorry, you asked me a question that I completely forgot because student I bankruptcy. Yeah, so now what they do with bankruptcy is they actually have someone that um sits down with you and you have to pay it back. Even if you're not paying the full amount back, but they do uh, require that you pay a portion of your debt back. So in a sense, it's kind of doing a settlement. And yeah. settlements are not bad things. Settlements, I would advise is if you get to the point where you're right now, everybody, well, I don't know with COVID-19 what's going on, but join the beginning of the year when people are filing for their taxes. That's the best time for you to settle. If you have a debt that is over five years, four years, and it's just lingering on your credit, settle it. But don't settle without just, you have to call the company. First, I would advise you call the company and you say, hey, this is what I have. Never, ever, ever, ever. So if the debt is outstanding, let's give flat numbers, $1,000. You're saying you owe $1,000. Do not say, I have, be reasonable. I have $100. That's not reasonable. 200 not reasonable. But start low but be realistic okay i only have 500 dollars. don't tell them where you're getting it you don't need to discuss the source but i have 500 dollars. is that something that you can settle with start low at a reasonable amount to where you think that they can meet you as a matter of fact i don't even suggest you giving them the amount see what they can offer first and then you try to offer it down to the lowest that you feel is comfortable so They'll say, well, we're looking for $900. They'll always really start high. You say, well, unfortunately, I don't have $900 to give you. Um, I'm working with my mother and see maybe she can give me $500. Is that something you can take? They'll come back and they'll say, no, absolutely not. Well, let me speak to somebody in your, above your pay grade. You speak to the next level. If they say, no, we can't do $500, but we can do $800. Okay, we're getting closer to my $500. Well, let me see what I can do. I can't get you five. I can't get you 800, but maybe I can get you another $50, maybe a hundred dollars, but I'll let you know. Once you come to that agreement, the agreement does not exist unless it's in writing. I do not care how much they tell you. Okay. That's fine. Send the money. Don't get something back. Email. They could take a picture of it and send it to your phone. However, they send it to you. Make sure you get it in writing because it does not exist unless it's in writing. You could have exactly. spoken to somebody and you say, "Oh, this person said this and that," and you go ahead and you send your six hundred dollars, and then now you have an outstanding balance of four hundred dollars because mm -hmm. that person didn't write it down. The person didn't completely get approval, and now you're stuck with the remaining balance. But you have it in your mind to settle this debt and it's not really settled. So get it in writing and hold on to your evidence for at least two years, just in case if the file for some reason doesn't get resolved, then mm -hmm. send it to someone else, sell it, or send it or sell it to another company. That way you have your evidence, your backup to say, hey, I paid this, it was settled. And as soon as it's settled, another thing I would advise is make sure within that 30 days they report it to the credit bureau. If they don't report it, dispute it with the credit bureau. You could even dispute it to the point where they can remove it altogether. But uh, dispute it. Make sure you get something showing you have your backup payment that you did, um, the letter that you settled, and make sure that you sent. they send you a letter saying your account has been closed in our office. Because again, it does not exist if it's not in writing. Even if they tell you your payment is your receipt, would you please send me something saying that I am no longer a client or customer or a debtor is the word that they use the debtors you don't want to be a debtor in their office so please wow. request the letters <laughs> awesome this is my question because I, I, um, I hear a lot of my clients and a lot of like um 
kids, younger, well, teenagers, almost um, college students, where they get into debt, but they don't know like the consequences of getting these credit cards now and the consequences of like maxing them out and then thinking the old way that you can just file for bankruptcy and then it's going to be removed from your credit within seven years. That's what most people think. No. You know what they can do? What companies can do is when that year mark comes, you can sell it to another company. That rotates it for another seven years. So uh -huh. if it's really something, and if it's something that's a substantial amount, they can actually file it even with the state that you owe this amount because that's considered income if you never paid it back. They can make you pay it to the state. So sometimes when you think, oh, you know, it's done and it'll be over with. I mean, at the end of the day, it does feel good to say that. Yeah, I'm credit worthy. You know, I've gone into hard times. And companies like this definitely, definitely understand, especially now they're going to have to deal with a lot of COVID-19, you know, people that are victim of this circumstance. But um, one thing you have to understand is if you talk to them, more likely than not, these companies will definitely say, Okay, let's see what we can do to resolve it. They would rather resolve it than not resolve it. Yeah, but not get any any money at all. We got one more question. I think this is the last question we're gonna take, and then we're gonna let you go because I know you just got home and you got a lot of things to do. Yeah. So, last question, but if you guys have any other questions for Paula, you can always put it in the comments. And in a minute, I'm gonna post. I'm gonna post her website, well, the website that, uh, for the company that she works for, and her phone number if you need to reach her after this um, live. So the other question is, are utility payments reported to the credit bureau? Utility payments, cell phones, those things are not reported to your credit bureau. But now one thing I realized is that um, companies like Experian, that's one of the three credit bureaus, one of the three, it's Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. They're now offering this thing called a boost. Um, I don't know if you've seen the commercials, but it's- I have really it. Yeah, so if you're doing it, your utility payments, your things like that, if you're doing those on time, it actually helps as a boost because it shows that you may not be able to manage with the credit cards, but you're actually doing other things that you're supposed to. So it helps with the boost a little bit. It's, so, connected, to your, it's connected to your bank account. So it almost like somehow it knows when you make the payments and if the payments were due on time. Yes, yes. And that does that does help. So I mean, at over. Overall, if you're if you're preparing a budget every single month, you should know. Okay, I have four thousand dollars coming in for this month. I'm already taking out four hundred dollars for my reserve, which I'm not looking at. I'm taking out another four hundred dollars for my tithes and offering. That's to each his own. But so the seed, God will bless you back in tenfold, however it goes. But you guys get the point. Um, so now you're really only left with $3,200. So now you have $3,200 to even knock out your debt. I understand people will say, oh, you know, I'm living paycheck to paycheck, but you can manage. If our parents, who is getting a lot less than we are getting, manage, we can manage. You can figure out a way for you to say, okay, um, I'm not making all this money. I'm living paycheck, paycheck to paycheck. What else can I do that can bring in some income? Can I braid hair? Um, can I take pictures? Can I do, I do events. I mean, I love what I do. It's an actual business, but that's extra income. So if you can figure out a way, if you're drowning and you can figure out another way to bring extra, like what's your passion? What passion do you have that can bring in extra income? And don't look at that extra income as money to go out to eat. And that's another thing that I didn't touch on needs and want. Do you need to buy that dinner? And I love to eat out and I do love to eat a nice seafood dish. But do you need it? Can you cook? Can you bring your lunch? Can you, you know what I mean? It makes a big difference. So figure that out. I mean, at the end of the day, you want to be able to live the American dream and not drown <laughs> while you're trying to live it. You know, and at the end of the day, what you're going through, what people see on the outside, you may think, Oh, you know, I'm bawling this, that, and the third. But you're not bawling in your head if you're suffocating from debt. So keep that in mind. Yes. Well, let's see. I don't think we have any more questions. Well, Paula, this is amazing. Not only did our viewers learn a lot, but I myself learned a lot. So this whole bankruptcy thing, I still thought it was the way that it was back in the days. No, if someone wants to ask me about that, I would just tell them the wrong stuff. <laughs> 
Well, there are no more questions, but Paula, how can people stay in touch with you um, past the live today? So if they need, they can always text me or email me my phone number. Um, you can give them my cell phone number. Um, that's my, actually my business, that's my um, business line. But they can call the 800 number, not my extension, if they need credit advice, um, if they need credit counseling, especially right now. If you are getting any um, unemployment, unemployment, you should be able to still um, pay your bills. You know, it, it, you might not think that's something that's important right now, but once this is all said and done, life is going to go back again and you're going to need to have that credit. So definitely try, if you can manage to keep up with your bills, definitely keep up with your bills. Um, take care of yourself first and that's all you could do. They can call if they have questions after today regarding the credit, I'm not going to the credit. Yes, they will actually, there are counselors available that will help them um, manage, budget, pretty much everything that I just talked about. They can answer all those questions. They're actually, um, they're, they're cooking classes for this. They're trained. I'm giving you stuff from experience, from um, what I've learned, but they're actually trained counselors that know these things that can definitely advise you. So um, keep in mind too, one little thing that I didn't mention, yes, you can get that new car whether you need it or not, but that interest rate might be through the roof where you could be paying that car off in five years. That credit, you'll be paying it off in seven years. So something that would cost you maybe, you know, a lot cheaper, you're paying a lot more because you don't have that good credit. So financial freedom does make a difference. Uh -huh. Educate yourself financially. Education is key. Um, yeah. We got two comments. Um, Sandra said, thank you for all this information. Hi, Sandra. Hi. Ash says, hi, Rosa. <laughs> hi, Ash. Thank you for joining us. Well, guys. Thank you, Paula, for uh, joining us and for being a big, a big, bold, beautiful woman and taking the leap in doing the spot, even though you never did it before, but you did amazing. Thank you. Oh my God. Okay. So we'll be back tomorrow, guys, with day number three of the five-day um, virtual summit. So stay tuned. Bye. Bye, Rosa. Thank you again. Bye.